TV might be all about enjoying a little bit of escapism, but sometimes the real world gets in the way. And there's no more shocking an example of this than when a beloved actor dies, forcing a show to say goodbye to the character they played. Miguel Ferrer was part of an accomplished show business family. He was the son of Oscar-winning actor Jose Ferrer and 50s pop singer Rosemary Clooney, as well as a cousin of superstar George Clooney. A prolific actor, he joined the cast of CBS's NCIS Los Angeles in 2012 to play Owen Granger, assistant director of the NCIS and overseer of the Office of Special Projects in the LA branch. Ostensibly arriving to hunt down a killer, he's really there to keep an eye on the show's regular squad and bring his experience as a CIA officer to the team. In a 2016 episode, A.D. Granger tells his colleagues that he's dying from a form of cancer, possibly related to exposure to Agent Orange during his time carrying out government missions in Southeast Asia. Granger later disappears, disappearing from his hospital bed and presumably dying from terminal cancer off-screen. By the time Granger's storyline was wrapped in 2017, Ferrer had died too. Like his character, Ferrer had been suffering from cancer and passed away the same year at the age of 61. After a few years plying his trade as a film actor, John Ritter returned to television in 2002's Eight Simple Rules for Dating My Teenage Daughter, and TV has always been good to him. He won an Emmy for his work on Three's Company, and he starred for three years on the 90s CBS rom-com Hearts of Fire. In Eight Simple Rules, Ritter played befuddled family man Paul Hennessy, who's deeply anxious about his kids aging into rebellious, independent teens. Ritter had only filmed one full season of the ABC sitcom when he fell ill on set in September 2003, complaining of nausea, weakness, and chest pain. Later that day, 54-year-old Ritter had died of an undiagnosed heart ailment called an aortic dissection. After a brief hiatus, Eight Simple Rules returned to television, necessarily revamped due to the loss of its star. The two-part episode Goodbye reveals that Paul died after collapsing at the grocery store. In subsequent episodes, James Garner and David Spade join the cast as Grandpa Jim and Nephew CJ, respectively, who move in to help the widowed Kate Hennessy raise her three kids. Will Lee was a regular presence on Sesame Street from the beginning, portraying Mr. Hooper, the kindly proprietor of Hooper's store. Big Bird absolutely adores the sweet old man, and not just because he mixes up a mean birdseed milkshake, Lee made public appearances as Mr. Hooper and recorded segments for Sesame Street up until November 1982. One month later, Lee died of a heart attack in New York City's Lenox Hill Hospital at the age of 74. A survey conducted shortly before his death found that Mr. Hooper was the most recognized human adult on Sesame Street. In the wake of his passing, Sesame Street producers were left with the monumental task of having to explain the death of Mr. Hooper and the concept of death in general to an audience of extremely young and emotionally vulnerable children. The series ultimately decided to tackle this issue head-on, with the help of some consulting child psychologists. Airing on Thanksgiving Day, 1983, the absolutely heartbreaking episode in question finds the childlike Big Bird unable to locate Mr. Hooper, and the adults on Sesame Street gently explaining to him that the old shopkeeper has died and that death is final. You know, I'm gonna miss you, Mr. Looper. That's Hooper, Big Bird, <laughs> Hooper. As Big Bird learns, it's okay to be sad about loss, but also that Mr. Hooper will live forever in the memories of all who loved him. Nicholas Calisandro worked extensively in television in the 1960s and 1970s, both as an actor and as a director. In 1982, he started work on Cheers, portraying Ernie Pantuso, the easygoing bartender who'd once coached bar owner Sam Malone in his baseball days. Coach became Calisanto's most recognizable role, which is a truly impressive feat given the breadth of his career. When he was cast on Cheers, Colasanto was well into his 50s and already suffering from heart problems. His health took a turn for the worse in late 1984. Following a hospitalization for water in his lungs, he couldn't get medical clearance to return to the rigors of shooting Cheers. In February 1985, the 61-year-old actor died of a heart attack. A few months later, Woody Harrelson joined the cast as Cheers' new bartender, Woody Boyd, following a brief explanation of Coach's passing. Coach is mentioned sporadically through the rest of the show's run. Phil Hartman dominated Saturday Night Live during his nine-year stint on the show, but he then moved on to another iconic ensemble show, NBC's workplace sitcom News Radio. Hartman played Bill McNeil, an obnoxious, rude, self-absorbed newsreader for New York City radio station WNYX. 
He portrayed the part with relish from 1995 to 1998, making his final appearance in the Titanic-themed fourth season finale. In May 1998, before the fifth season of News Radio went into production, Hartman's difficult marriage to wife Bryn Omdahl ended in unspeakable tragedy. The deeply troubled model and actress shot a sleeping Hartman to death, then took her own life. Hartman was just 49 years old. News Radio's fifth season, which aired the following fall, begins with Bill Moves On, in which the WNYX team heads to the office after the funeral of Bill McNeil, said to have died from a heart attack. Most of the episode consists of the other characters talking about Bill and even openly crying, tears that might well have been real and could easily have been shed for Hartman himself. Riverdale is the place where multiple generations of iconic teen pop culture converge. Based on the classic Archie Comics stable of characters, the CW series deposits them in a dreary, foggy, Twin Peaks-like town absolutely rife with dark doings. Many of the grown-ups are portrayed by teen idols of yore, including 80s Brad Packer Molly Ringwald as Archie's mother and Beverly Hills 90210's Luke Perry as Archie's wise and doting father, Fred Andrews. In the first episode of Season 4, Archie finds out that his father has unexpectedly been killed by a hit-and-run driver after he stopped to help a stranded motorist played by Perry's own 90210 love interest, Shannon Doherty. That abrupt choice came about due to the tragic real-life death of the actor. In February 2019, Perry suffered a severe stroke at the age of 52 and was immediately hospitalized and placed in a medically induced coma. He died just a few days later. The Sopranos blew audiences away with its uniquely thoughtful exploration of what makes a man turn to a life of violent crime. Tony Soprano really is a complicated guy. He's a mob boss and a family man, who has his rivals killed but then needs to discuss it with his therapist. And The Sopranos suggest that a lot of Tony's anguish and emotional pain stems from his mother, Livia, a manipulative, self-serving, and conspiratorial abuser. Nancy Marchand played the character with a fascinating, chilling intensity. A four-time Emmy winner for her work on newspaper drama Lou Grant, Marchand added two more nominations to her resume for portraying Livia. The second, however, came posthumously. In June 2000, the 71-year-old Marchand died of cancer and chronic pulmonary disease. The Sopranos' third season hit HBO in early 2001, and in the episode Proshai Levushka, it's revealed that Livia Soprano died in her sleep, having suffered a stroke. John Spencer worked extensively from the 1960s onwards, frequently playing tough and world-weary cops, lawyers, soldiers, and a number of other authority figures. But they merely prepared him for his signature role, that of recovering alcoholic and White House Chief of Staff Leo McGarry on NBC's The West Wing. Spencer earned five Emmy nominations for this role, finally winning the prize in 2002. In the show's seventh and final season, McGarry is picked to be the vice presidential candidate on the ticket of presidential candidate Matt Santos. The duo wins the election, Although McGarry doesn't live to see it, he dies of a heart attack in his hotel room on election night, just before the polls close. Hey. He died, Josh. This sad twist was necessitated by the death of Spencer, who suffered a fatal heart attack a few days before his 59th birthday in December 2005. Andrew Campbell wasn't a main character on Mad Men, but he was an influential one the stern, aloof, and disapproving father of slimy young advertising executive Pete Campbell made quite the mark on his son's psyche. He appears in just one first-season episode, 2007's New Amsterdam, and could have eventually made some return appearances if not for the tragic and unexpected death of his actor, Christopher Alpert. In January 2008, Alpert was killed by an avalanche while skiing in California's San Gabriel Mountains. In the second-season episode, Flight One, Employees at the Sterling Cooper ad agency listen to radio news about an American Airlines flight that crashed shortly after taking off from New York City. That is, in fact, an actual tragedy that occurred in March 1962, another testament to the 60s set show's commitment to historical accuracy. Later in the episode, Pete learns that his father was on the flight and that he sadly didn't survive. Larry Hagman played one of the most famous TV characters of all time, but not quite one of the most beloved. From 1978 to 1991, he starred as backstabbing oil magnate J.R. Ewing on Dallas. The Texas tycoon behaves so badly that somebody was bound to take a shot at him, and in 1980, somebody finally did. The second season of Dallas ended on a cliffhanger, 
when an unidentified attacker guns down JR, leaving millions of viewers to wonder if the character would survive. He did survive the shooting, and Ewing went on to survive another brush with death in the final episode of Dallas, when a ghost convinces the wicked man to kill himself. Whether JR lives or dies isn't explicitly revealed, but modern fans can assume he survived, as he's a main character in TNT's 2012 Dallas continuation. Shortly after the 2012 show's first season aired, Hagman died in November 2012 at the age of 81 after a fight against cancer. So Dallas decided to have J.R. Ewing die too, and writers revived the Who Shot J.R. slogan to do it. In a 2013 episode, an unidentified person puts a bullet in the industrialist, later revealed to be a setup by J.R. himself, to arrange one more tricky business deal while he dealt with his terminal cancer. Portraying the dim but sweet Finn Hudson on Fox's musical dramedy Glee was a breakthrough role for Canadian actor Corey Monteith. The likable star anchored the popular teen show for four seasons, all the while quietly struggling with a powerful drug addiction. His mother, Anne McGregor, told ABC News that Monteith started using drugs at 15 and struggled with substance addiction off and on for the next decade and a half. In July 2013, the body of the 31-year-old actor was found in his Vancouver hotel room. He had died of a fatal overdose of heroin and alcohol. In October 2013, Glee aired an episode entitled The Quarterback, in which Finn's friends, fellow club members, family, and teachers all agonizingly mourn their friend and colleague. The series also noticeably refuses to discuss how Finn died. Everyone wants to talk about how he died too, but who cares? One moment in his whole life. Finn is remembered frequently through the rest of the show's run. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please call the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration's 24-7 National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357. Each and every episode of the warm, crackling, low-key dramedy Gilmore Girls features an odd credit. Special appearance by Edward Herman. The actor appeared in many episodes, so he was a recurring cast member. But this unique introduction spoke to his status as the best-known and most esteemed member of the Gilmore Girls Ensemble. Before he portrayed the wealthy and impeccably dressed Richard Gilmore, Herman had portrayed President Franklin Roosevelt in multiple TV projects, had been part of projects such as American Playhouse and St. Elsewhere, and served as the voice of the History Channel. As the New York Times aptly put it, he had an unmistakably noble air. Gilmore Girls ended its original seven-season run in 2007, but returned for four made-for-Netflix movie-length episodes in 2016. In the interim, Herman ultimately lost his struggle with brain cancer, spending nearly a month in a New York intensive care unit before passing away in December 2014. Accordingly, Gilmore Girls' A Year in the Life revolves around his character's passing. A few months before the events of the miniseries, Richard Gilmore dies of a heart attack, leaving the Gilmore women, particularly his wife Emily, in deep grief and struggling to find a way to move on. Lee Thompson Young became a teen TV star by playing a teen TV star. As Jet Jackson on the Disney Channel's The Famous Jet Jackson, he portrayed a young actor struggling with fame, family, and school. Young successfully transitioned to more adult projects, but the most prominent role of his adult life was that of Barry Frost on Rizzoli and Isles, a detective who often assists the titular duo. On August 19, 2013, Young failed to report to the Rizzoli and Isles set as expected. Police went to his home to see if he was all right and discovered that the 29-year-old actor had taken his own life. The show briefly shut down production and in June 2014 addressed the fate of Young's character. In the episode Goodbye, Frost is revealed to have died off-screen in a car accident, and the other characters attend his memorial service. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call or chat online with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK, 1-800-273-8255. A versatile character actor, Christopher Evan Welsh appeared in many films and TV shows of the 21st century, but he's likely best known for what would turn out to be his final role, Peter Gregory on Silicon Valley. Welch appeared in five episodes of the first season of the HBO tech world satire, courted for his cash by the main characters as they worked to launch a potentially revolutionary app. In December 2013, four months before Silicon Valley debuted, Welch died in a Los Angeles hospital at age 48, following a years-long battle with lung cancer. Silicon Valley waited until its second season premiere in 2015 to mention what happened to Peter Gregory. 
Richard sees a news item online about the investor's sudden death and later learns from Gregory's associate Monica that he keeled over during a safari while trying to run from a stray hippo that had wandered into his tent, which in fairness is a heck of a way to go. Uh, oh, that is <clears throat> so <clears throat> very strange. Very sad. Very sad. Tragic. Very strange. If nothing else, USA's 2002 series Monk is memorable for its unique tone. It follows a detective, Adrian Monk, who often solves some serious grisly crimes. But Monk is also a comedy, with plenty of carefully and consciously kind humor derived from the title character's obsessive-compulsive disorder. Helping to strike that balance was the character of Dr. Charles Kroger, Monk's patient and helpful psychiatrist, who works with him to deal with his OCD and lingering grief over the death of his wife. So it was a major blow to the show when the actor who portrayed him, Stanley Camel, passed away from a heart attack in April 2008. The first episode of the show's seventh season, the first without Camel, aired in July 2008 with a dedication to the actor. It's mentioned in dialogue that Dr. Kroger similarly died of a heart attack. Angel is a show about ageless beings and supernatural events, so death isn't all that final a concept for its various vampires, demons, and, uh, angels. When the Buffy the Vampire Slayer spinoff premiered in 1999, there were only three main characters, one of them being Doyle, a half-demonic hero who receives alarming visions that vampire detective Angel uses to solve his mysteries. Portraying the impish Irish rogue was Glenn Quinn, previously known for his work as Becky's ne'er-do-well husband Mark on Roseanne. In Hero, the ninth episode of Angel, Doyle sacrifices his own life to save Angels and never appears on the show again. However, frequent Angel writer and director Tom Minear really wanted to bring Doyle back. He told an Angel fan blog in 2007, Every once in a while I'd bring it up, but I'd get shot down. Any hopes of Doyle's return were rendered impossible, however, in 2002, when Quinn died of a drug overdose at age 32. Years later, his Roseanne character was also written out of the show. An episode of the 2018 reboot series mentions that Mark has died and ends with a dedication to Quinn himself. It's arguably easier for an animated series to handle the death of a cast member. As the performer's image is not used, producers can get a new, sound-alike actor to take over a role vacated by a death. Case in point, actress Grey Delisle Griffin became the new Martin Prince on The Simpsons after the death of original actor Rusi Taylor in 2019. This is largely because the show's writers were anxious about killing off a child character. But that's not the direction they took when Marsha Wallace died in October 2013. Wallace used her distinctive voice to play Bart Simpson's sarcastic and long-suffering fourth-grade teacher Mrs. Kerbopel for well over 20 years. As it turns out, Wallace simply wasn't replaceable, and so her character was retired. About a week after the 70-year-old passed away, the Simpsons paid tribute in an episode's opening credits. Bart's chalkboard message that week reads, We'll really miss you, Mrs. K. A March 2014 episode includes an epilogue in which Krabappel's husband, Ned Flanders, daydreams about their good times together and is joined in mourning by one of her students, Nelson Muntz. <laughs>